The Rebel Capitalist Show. All right, guys, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to welcome someone back to the Rebel Capitalist Show. He is a worldwide traveler and investor. He's kind of like Jim Rogers 2.0. His name is Tim Stermos. Tim, welcome back to the Rebel Capitalist Show, my friend. Thanks, George. Great to see you again. I guess it's been uh, almost a year since I was last on. So Yeah, uh, so for, for my viewers who might not know your backstory or kind of what you do, can you fill us in there? Because it's really fascinating. Sure. I mean, I uh, was actually born here in Tanzania, where I am now. I'm sitting in my home office in, in Tanzania. The sun's setting out the, the window here on the right. Um, I have a background in uh, equity research, uh, 25, 26 years in Asia before I came back over here to Africa. Um, I have a number of different business interests. I'm a partner in sovereignman.com, where I uh, write an investment newsletter and contribute content. Uh, then I run a new fund that I set up about a year ago called the African Lions Fund. And that's the main reason for being here on the ground in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. And there are a few boutique Africa funds around, but there's very few where the manager actually lives and breathes the stuff day to day by living in Africa. So that was the point of difference that I tried to add to my fund. And it's, uh, it's been going well. Tim, how important is that? Because I talk about real estate all the time. And I'm someone who started investing in real estate in 2012 when I retired. But mm -hmm. then in 2015, I started investing in real estate overseas in Medellin, right. Colombia, a place that I'm yeah. sure you're very familiar with. And, uh, I, you know, people ask me about Dubai. They ask me about real estate all over the world. And I say, listen, I can't give you a really great opinion because I need to go there. I need to be there physically for at least two or three months and do that boots on the ground research. Because if you don't do that, just looking at stuff on the internet, you, you really got no clue. Is it the same with the type of investing you do as stocks and bonds, or is that more specific to real estate? I think probably real estate is an even higher degree of, of localization. So it's very, very important to get the lay of the land, as you point out. Uh, but it's also very important in my business, I think, as a fundamentals driven investor. I mean, if you're a chartist and you're just watching the way right. that price move and the psychology that, that you know, applies to all markets, uh, with equities and bonds, you can get that just from looking at the internet. But if you're a fundamentals driven guy like me, I mean, I like to have a longer time frame with my investments. And, you know, I think it's valuable for clients uh, that I'm there on the ground doing stuff for them. Now, um, I first came back to Tanzania uh, just as a tourist three years ago. And that was when it all started for me to sort of get a feel for the place and, and understand the way that the business environment is and, and so on and so forth. And that would have never happened by looking on the internet, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> you, you land and you all of a sudden you're seeing, you know, all these signs and advertisements. And, you know, I, I like to see what little mom and pop stores are selling, you know, what the popular products are, what, what the big billboard advertisements are, you know, for beer or cars or whatever. So it's really important to be on the ground uh, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, you know what my secret was, is I would always go to the local mall Whenever mm -hmm. I went to a place for the first time, and this is what I did in Australia before I retired, I, I grew my business into Sydney and Melbourne, most of the areas in Australia and Singapore and a lot of different places overseas. But I'd have the driver take me right to the main mall because I'd want to see you know, how the people were spending money, what the energy was like, what the vibe was like, what the anchor stores were. And that in and of itself would tell me like 90% of what I needed to know to determine if I wanted to do business there. Makes total sense. Yeah. And that's, that's big part of the boots on the ground uh, research that, that I also do. Unfortunately with COVID, um, you know, kind of shutting travel down or at least convenient travel down. I haven't visited as many other African countries uh, physically as I would have liked in this first year. Um, but Tanzania was the original impetus for this, and we've allocated about 50% of the fund uh, to Tanzania at this point. I've also spent time in Kenya. Um, I have some good contacts in Rwanda and Uganda, but I haven't actually been there physically myself. Thankfully, um, with all the technology these days, uh, we have lots of uh, conferences and, and meetings and things done over Zoom. So part of the process in my fund is to actually speak with management once I've made an initial um, decision that I'm interested in investing something. 
And that's all able to be done over Zoom, but you miss that sort of on the street uh, research that we, we talked about before by not being able to go and physically check out countries. So I've been a little bit cautious expanding beyond these East African markets where I've been. Uh, we do own mainly blue chip stocks in the fund. Um, and I'd like to be able to add some smaller growth stocks and, and, and small caps. Um, but I, I'm really not comfortable doing that until I go and spend more time on the ground in places like Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, and, and check them out as well, uh, the way I've done here in, in Tanzania and Kenya. I want to get into your portfolio and kind of your investment strategy, not just from investing in smaller African countries or international markets, but also portfolio construction value, investing, uh, sure. you know, buying cash flow, dividend paying stocks and whatnot. But I, I'm curious about Tanzania because with the, you know, I call it the Cervasa sickness just to be YouTube friendly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't think they're too uptight about that anymore, but when this first came out, they, they used to be really uptight about even right, using right, the word right. COVID or yeah. coronavirus or anything like that. But, um, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but Tanzania, when they had the, the former president in charge there, he thought it was just fake news, or at least that's what he yeah, was saying. Exactly. So you guys had a lot of uh, freedom and liberty there when the rest of the, the world, basically, was pretty much locked up in a cage. Is, is, am I correct to assume that? Or how, how did yeah, it work totally there? How right. did it feel? Totally right. So... I was fortunate. I was living in, in Bali. That was my base. So we still have our place there and I have business interests in Hong Kong and down in Australia and you know, lots of business contacts and friends in Singapore. So Bali was a great base for me. I was traveling to Hong Kong, Australia, Singapore, Philippines, various places around the region on a regular basis. Um, then when uh, the Cerveza sickness, as you call it, hit, <laughs> I was kind of stuck in Bali for six months. And okay. uh, that's not normal for me. Um, during that time, I took the opportunity to launch, uh, you know, a couple of businesses. I, I run this blog site, Global Value Hunter, which um, also, you know, where I put up a lot of my writings about Africa, but also other value investing relevant content. And uh, out of that, you know, there was um, a lot of interest in the fund that I had made up my mind to start. And then that all kind of funneled through and, and things took off. But one of the reasons that I decided to come over to Tanzania for the launch of the fund in September last year was precisely the fact that, uh, you know, there were no restrictions. Yeah. Bali was kind of shutting down and I could get on a, a Qatar Airways flight and, and basically fly via Jakarta and Doha to, um, or from Jakarta actually, to, to Doha, straight to Tanzania, no requirement for any testing or masks or anything like that. Um, so as a, as a freedom loving individual, you know, why not? Especially yeah. that I had a new business interest over there. There was a good reason to be on the ground. And I brought my family over. I have a wife and two young daughters. They came a week after me also from, from Indonesia. And we've all been here ever since. Um, they're a little bit more uptight about COVID nowadays, but not much change, honestly, you know, there are vaccines available. Some people choose to wear masks, but the, the attitude is much more refreshing than it is in a lot of countries where it is really up to the individual to decide, you know, what they're comfortable with. If you want to take precautions, fine. That's, that's your business and no one's going to ridicule you. Uh, if you don't particularly care about it, that's fine too. So it's been very, uh, very free, if you like, compared to a lot of other places. You know, we visited uh, Canada, we visited Dubai, um, they have their own policies. Uh, Kenya has curfews. Uh, you have to wear still, a mask. Still now, huh? Yeah, even now. Wow. Uh, Dubai as well. You know, they uh, they were one of the early adopters of vaccines, and it seems to have worked out for them. You know, they've opened up um, since a long time ago, and there haven't been any further lockdowns. Uh, but that was as a result of the government being comfortable that a lot of people had been vaccinated and you got to wear a mask anywhere, anytime you go out in public and whatever, which in, in a place like Dubai, where it's like, you know, 50 degrees Celsius for a couple of months a year, that's pretty, pretty nasty. Um, we spent so a couple they still of weeks require there. masks in Dubai. Uh, yeah, as I understand it, I mean, I haven't been there since April, um, but friends of mine tell me it's still a requirement, but there are a lot of people that are kind of, you know, not really bothering and it seems that it's not as strictly enforced as it was, uh, which yeah. 
seems but uh, but in changed. tanzania it's just completely up to the individual are there businesses that require masks or, or vaccine uh, mandates anything only, like that? the only ones that sort of uh pay strict lip service to it uh tend to be foreign owned businesses like you oh. know, uber makes you wear a mask if you if you take an uber which I, I do on a daily basis i mean some drivers don't really care but you know they can get in trouble with uber management if, if they don't wear one and they don't ask their passengers to wear one uh, DHL was another business, uh, you know, foreign owned where I went in to send a package and you couldn't get in unless you were wearing a mask, but local businesses generally tend to be, um, fairly relaxed about it. That said, I mean, the climate here is ideal for, um, you know, dealing with the virus, you sitting outside most of the time, lots of sunlight, fresh air, like most of the restaurants and cafes that we go to, we never, ever sit inside. So it's just yeah. not an issue. Uh, yeah, that's is great. All right. Well, yeah, I wanted to touch on that because I know a lot of my listeners and viewers are kind of curious about, you know, where on the planet Earth, quite literally, yeah, it's, uh, can it's they experience freedom? And I say, well, yeah. right now, I don't I mean Florida. <laughs> That's about it. Florida, Texas, Arizona, maybe Sweden. Right. But I, yes. I, it's great to include Tanzania in that list. And it's it's been that way, uh, you know, since the get go, really. Yeah. All right. Let's get back into investing. I always tell people that my personal portfolio, I like to set it up in a 10, 80, 10. And what that means is 10% for insurance. And I just consider that physical gold and then 80% in investments. And I define that as something that pays me to own it. Okay. So that would be a, a rental property or a dividend paying stock. And then I kind of go back to Jim Rogers and say, ideally what you want to do is you want to buy things when they're cheap yeah. and you want to sell them when they're expensive. But the pushback yep. I always get, especially from Americans, is George, nothing's cheap. We're, we're in an <laughs> everything bubble. But what I think true. what they're missing is they're they're just getting hyper focused on the S and P five hundred, or just right. the stocks in the United States or dollar denominated stocks. When if they could just kind of expand their horizons, they would find opportunities out there where there are stocks that are super cheap. Can you dive into that? Yeah, that's kind of what led me to where I am. You know, it was a dovetailing of the fact that I had been here on the ground in 2018 and seen, you know, businesses that dominate here in the country. One of my biggest investments is uh, the, the biggest investment, uh, the biggest cement company rather here in, in Tanzania. Mm. And um, I, I, I actually have a, a company called One Fair Investments. Uh, and the One Fair is short for it's an agglomeration of wonderful and fair, as in Buffett's old quip about buying wonderful businesses at fair prices. Right. Uh, ideally, cheap prices, but fair prices are fine if you're buying a wonderful business. So that's always been my kind of driving um, motivation. And as you say, if I looked at the US market, I couldn't find any wonderful businesses at fair prices. I could find plenty of wonderful businesses. And that's, that's the beauty of the US. I mean, you know, you guys know how to build really successful businesses. But they trade for, to a value investor like me, prices that are, are way too high. So I scoured the world. I had been writing this newsletter for Sovereign Man, the fourth pillar it's called, where we focus on deep value investments. So we just buy cheap stuff. Uh, and in Asia, there's a lot of cheap stuff around. Mm. Um, but they're not wonderful businesses. You know, they're, they're mediocre businesses that are really down on their luck and trading very cheaply. You know, the old Ben Graham style investing, if you like, cigar butts. Where, I was just going to say the cigar it. butt, right? Yeah, you buy it for cheaply <laughs> and then it revalues and you sell it and you've made some money. And I kind of got gradually more fed up with that because is there a lot of hard work to find these things, invest in them, and then endure the pain of watching and waiting and, you know, nothing right. happening. Often value stocks go down before they eventually re-rate. And I thought, ah, there's, there's got to be a better way. And African blue chip stocks is now my focus because there are a lot of wonderful businesses and they are trading at fair or even cheap prices. I mean, we have a blended PE um, for the portfolio in, in the fund that I run that's uh, you know, not even eight times. Mm -hmm. And this is for the bluest of blue chips. You know, these are the dominant companies in their industries and in the countries where we- Yeah, invest. I know last time we talked about a beer company. That's right. So uh, actually there was a bit of a flurry of excitement uh, today. Tanzania Breweries is, is the, the stock that we own here in Tanzania. It's a dominant beer company, got about 80% market share. And 
their competitor has been doing pretty well in fairness recently. So there's been a lot of guys kind of wondering and waiting when they're going to fight back. But just today they announced that they've come out with a new, uh, brand new brand um, and they're going to launch that soon. And, you know, they're fighting back against the competitor, which they should have been doing all along, uh, given that they're so dominant, you know, they can spend a, a tiny fraction of their revenue on a marketing campaign and basically blow the other guy out of the water. But they had been acquired by, um, AB InBev out of uh, Belgium, um, which also owns uh, you know, Anheuser Busch AB, um, and they kind of lost their way a little bit. Uh, but that's one that we own a lot of because it's really been smashed, and it's obviously a dominant, almost a monopoly business here, and, and will do very well long term given the, the young demographics here in Tanzania. Um, telecoms are another big. Uh, what are the dividends industry. on those, Tim? Uh, so TBL, Tanzania Breweries, is not paying uh, large dividends at the moment, but for our portfolio as a whole, we're on about 8.5% uh, yield, and a lot of that is from the banks and the telecoms and, and things like that. So Right, that's fantastic. It's, um, it's a pretty good valuation considering that these are, you know, the dominant companies, um, and they have a long growth runway ahead of them. And it's really one of the few places in the world where you can find um, that kind of valuation at the moment. Some of the Asian markets, West Asia, um, you know, the, the, the Stans, Uzbekistan has, has been doing very well for uh, uh, a friend of mine. I don't know whether you've had him on, uh, Scott Osheroff, he, he's managing a fund there. Um, so that's, you know, this part of the world is really uh, good pickings at the moment. Yeah, I'm sure most people would push back and say, okay, Tim, I get it. But what about the political risk? Uh, you know, how do that, you determine that's that? That's always the case that, in yeah. Africa. Um, political risk, currency risk, that sort of thing. So we try and have a macro overlay first before we go and dive into the micro. Uh, so Tanzania is, is one of the rare countries in Africa that's never really had any ethnic strife or civil wars or anything like that. All of the former presidents of Tanzania have retired, you know, and lived on in the country in peace. Uh, a lot of uh, African countries, um, the president either gets shot or he has to flee and leave yeah. in exile. It's not yeah. like that here at all. Um, but yeah, we filter definitely by political risk and, and currency risk. Those are the two main ones. Uh, Zambia was out of bounds for currency reasons uh, until recently. Uh, it seems to have turned around. They just had a, an election and they booted out the former president and a new guy who's actually got experience running businesses is in power. Um, Nigeria is out of bounds at the moment for both political and currency risks. There's a little bit of political risk in Kenya at the moment. There's an election coming up next year, which tends to dampen down economic activity. Everyone uh, kind of holds back until the result of the election is known and then, mm. they, inv then they invest. But, you know, my, my comeback uh, would really be, well, show me a place in the world where there isn't any political risk in, in this day and age. You know what All I mean? Right. It's, Africa has always been uh, viewed as risky, but to me, on a relative basis, it's less risky now when you compare it to a lot of these other countries, which are also facing, uh, you know, a lot of political risk and division. Uh, obviously, the U.S. being a prime example, but it's hard to really point to anywhere in the world where you would go, okay, that's a really stable place, and it's going to stay that way for 20 years, and I'm happy investing my capital there. Yeah. So, it, it's still very important to be careful um, not to you know, end up with too much of your capital in one country that goes down the tubes here in Africa. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm fairly comfortable uh, with, with Tanzania. And, and how is, how, what's your opinion of the gal there? Um, so, I mean, she seems to be more of a, a, you know, outward looking president than, than Magafuli, the former guy, he was, he was very nationalistic and, yeah, too much so even. Uh, he, he didn't like foreigners much. He was a bit xenophobic. Yeah, there's a balance, right? You, you've right. got to stick up for your own people and your own country. But you also need to invite people in who have capital, who can help you develop and grow and, and transfer knowledge and technology. Um, so that's the biggest change. Um, so it's, it's more friendly now here for foreign businesses and investment is, is flowing in again. Uh, so those things are very positive. Um, whether uh, you know it, it stays that way longer term, we're not sure. 
uh, it's still very much a, a sort of a feeling uh, of, of the way for the current president and, um, you know, the honeymoon period, if you like. Uh, but it's, it's pretty stable. You know, that's, that's the main thing here. There's only yeah. really one political party that has any cloud and, you know, everyone's kind of on the same page that development of the country has to be goal number one. Um, so in that respect, um, you know, we're, we're traveling. Okay. I'm, yeah. I'm perfectly happy with, with the way things are going right now. How are the corporate taxes in these areas generally? Uh, they're kind of mid-range, similar to the U.S. Uh, here in Tanzania, it's 30%. Um, there is a VAT, which is uh, a little bit too high, in my opinion, uh, 18%. Uh, wow. So as, as an entrepreneur, um, it, it's pretty tough here. So for, for me, investing in big blue chip stocks, what I like to say is that those companies are actually even more protected. Their dominance... Yeah, like it's it kind it's of a moat around them. Yeah, it's hard to come in as an entrepreneur and start something. Now, to get my residency visa here, I started a business. Uh, so I've been through all that, um, you know, rigmarole of registering a business and getting a tax ID and a you know, work permit and a business license and yada, yada, yada. So for entrepreneurs, I think this is a tough country unless you have a, a real golden opportunity that's a slam dunk and the profit margins are so high that you can, um, you know, give some of this away to the, the regulation costs and, and the taxes. Um, but, you know, from my point of view as a public markets equity investor in the big blue chips, that that's no bad thing. You know, it's, it's kind of quirky because I mean, I'm all for, you know, people starting businesses and, and, low taxes and, and freedom and so on. So maybe that's something that, that a lot of these countries are still getting wrong, in fact. Um, yeah. But from my, from, you know, my investor's point of view, it's no bad thing. That, that's kind of the paradox. <laughs> yeah. So how has, let's talk about FX, because if, if for dollar investors, if their expenses, assuming their expenses are denominated in dollars, I'm sure that's another one of their concerns. So is there a way that you hedge that risk at all in the portfolio? And then how has the portfolio done over the last, let's say, year or so when the dollar has been around 90, 93 sure. on the DXY? Sure, sure, sure. So uh, we, to answer the question about hedging, no. Hedging is prohibitively expensive. Uh, so our view on exchange rates is basically that if history is a guide, they will gradually depreciate over time against the US dollar. And it's not a steady kind of depreciation. Uh, I mean, obviously, there's 54 countries in Africa, everywhere is different. So it's hard to right. generalize. But in general, most of them at any given time will be in a weakening trend. At the moment, uh, there are a couple that have strengthened for us, including the Ugandan shilling. They, they have a, a very big um, coffee export uh, mm. earning economy. Coffee's doing well, so they they have an investment inflows. There's an oil and gas uh, project there that's bringing a lot of investment. So that's dollars. appreciated against the dollar. Yeah, so that's a that's an outlier. Uh, although having said that, the Tanzanian shilling actually has now also appreciated uh, on a 12 month view ever so slightly um, compared to when I started investing with funds capital last September. So those two, uh, the the ones that have uh, appreciated slightly. Everything else is kind of um, down slightly, but no disasters. So the way I view it is, um, you know, the, the returns available on capital here in Africa are quite high by global standards because there's a, a dearth of capital and there's lots of investment opportunities. So you can generate a healthy mid 20s, low 30s return on equity, even as a big business. Mm. And as an investor, I'm looking to buy those businesses at, you know, between one and two times book. So I'm compounding the equity in the business by proxy. Uh, I'm not doing it. Someone else is doing the hard work right. um, you know, in, a, in a sort of 15 to 20% range, uh, which, which is kind of my, my goal. Um, as a dollar-based fund and a dollar-based investor, yes, over time, that call it a 15% compound return, when you put it back into hard currency, might only be 11, 12%. So yeah. that's kind of high, and which is still acceptable, uh, I think, to most people. So that's how we view it. So the returns are high enough that you can basically eat some exchange rate depreciation over time. That's, that's how we view it. That makes sense. What's the real estate like there, Tim? 
So Tanzania, unfortunately, was a socialist country when it uh, was uh, in the when it gained gained its independence. So in Tanzania, the government still owns everything. And you can only get long-term lease on stuff. Oh, like a 99-year lease or something? Yeah, and as a non-citizen, you can only get a lease on um, something that's incidental to running your business. Mm. So, I mean, if you ran a, a B&B or a boutique hotel and you lived on site, that'd be fine. But you, you can't actually own something uh, yourself as an investor. But there are plenty of other countries around the region where you can. Um, the, the one I have direct experience with is, is Kenya. I had a, a bit of a look around when I was in Nairobi. I don't know whether you've ever been to Nairobi or whether any, any of your viewers and listeners have, but it's um, capital city of Kenya. Not as big as Dar es Salaam where I am now in terms of population, but it's, you know, it's a proper city. Um, and it sits almost on the equator up at altitude. So it's a bit like Medellin and these places where it has this eternal spring type climate. Yeah, and it's close to Kilimanjaro too, isn't it? Exactly. That's right. Just up the road. And um, it's really pleasant climate all year round. Um, beautiful gardens. You know, it, it, it almost looks like England, you know, and it, it was yeah. a British colony. And then the old joke is, oh, the, the English brought all their plants with them and, you know, nice gardens and things. But long story short, Nairobi had um, uh, an overbuilding uh, real estate boom sort of in the early 2010s through, I think, 2017 is when the market kind of uh, came off and uh, still in the doldrums uh, for local people most of the stuff that they built is too expensive so there's, mm. there's no you know demand for it but if you go there as a as a non-local uh, with a higher you know level of income and you're used to higher prices everything seems really cheap you know to what, me especially do you, do you know what it is approximately price, price per square meter uh, you could pick up a, a really nice apartment in, in one of the nice leafy suburbs of Nairobi, from what I could tell, for um, $750, uh, dollars per square meter That's for a, a big apartment. Yeah. That's uh, cheap. For the smaller ones, the per square meter price probably goes up a little bit. Yeah, right. Um, but it, it's a function of, you know, this overbuilding, and then it's not easy to get finance. Um, you know, mortgages are basically you know, non-existence by our standards. So it's probably more of a cash market. Um, and then unfortunately for, for non-residents, there is a fairly hefty withholding tax on rental income. So I don't know how the numbers stack up as an investor, but what I thought to myself was, well, you know, if I wanted to base myself in Nairobi for a couple of years, which is a possibility down the line, um, I could buy a really nice apartment to live in um, and use it. And then hopefully in five, 10 years time, when the market's cleared, you know, it would have also appreciated nicely. That, that was kind of how I thought about the real estate there. Yeah, that um, makes sense. You know, I've, I've done a little bit of homework on Nairobi and this was back in, oh boy, 2017 or no, 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 this would have been 2015 or so. Uh, yeah. I was thinking about buying a hotel. And uh -huh. I, so, and I, I think I was in Medellin or Ecuador at the time, something like that. And, uh, I, I said, okay, where, I, I don't care where I go on the entire planet. I'm just going to keep it wide open. And so yep. what metric can I use? So the metric I right. came up with was the average wage relative to the average price of a hotel room on a nightly basis. And I use okay. that as kind of a ratio. So obviously I wanted the, the maximum price for a hotel room per night, and then the minimum uh, average wage. Right. And uh, Nairobi was right at the top because yeah. they were charging like two, $300 a night for a hotel yep. room, but right. yet wages there are very, very, very low, similar to what you'd have okay. in like Medellin. And uh, yeah. I remember they were really good. Um, I can't recall some of the others, but I remember I was gonna go to Croatia. That was one on my list. So I actually went to Croatia and then I ended up going down to Montenegro and, and I was supposed to go to Nairobi, but I ended up staying in Montenegro for probably three <laughs> or four so months. Much. Yeah. Cause I liked it so much just on a personal level, but uh, yeah. So is it still like that? Is that something that you've noticed? Yeah. So I, I spent some time there uh, last December and January with my family and uh, probably the, the room rates have also come down. There were probably a lot of completions of hotels and service departments uh, in the late uh, 2010s that, that knocked that down. And COVID probably also had an impact, but we were in a two bedroom service department 
you know, brand new. It wouldn't have been out of place in, in Singapore, honestly. I mean, it was, wow. it was nicely finished and, and decked out. And um, we were paying only like 150 bucks a night. So that, that's kind of a, a, you know, more of a value story. But yeah, the, the fancy hotels, I think, are still, you know, able to charge um, a premium. Uh, yeah, but 150 bucks a night. I mean, if you could, uh, let's just assume that we move on past, uh, you know, the cerveza sickness, if you had an 80% yeah. occupancy rate at 150 a night at $750 a square meter. I mean, that's, I, mean, I, I don't have the math right in front of me, but I can tell just by, you know, my experience <laughs> in real estate that that's going to be a great return. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I actually, uh, I was reading the paper today, uh, the Kenyan paper, and um, there's, there's actually some hotel in liquidation, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was 43 rooms and, you know, some famous bar and restaurant on the same premises. Seemed like a very small land area, mm. but 43 rooms. And if I wasn't mistaken, they were asking just over $2 million for that in a liquidation sale. Mm. So, and that was in Nairobi or Tanzania? That's in Nairobi. Yeah, in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, yeah. in, in one of the nice suburbs. Um, so what's that? 55000 per key for a, for a boutique hotel, something like that. Yeah. Which you could probably, yeah, you could probably get a hundred bucks a night for those rooms. I don't know for sure, but just throwing a, a figure out there. Yeah. Um, one thing I don't think most Americans realize, and they would realize this quickly if they went to a place like Ecuador or Colombia or Tanzania is just how dominant the, the monopoly businesses are. And let's use beer That's right. as an example. Yeah. Like you come to the United States and you go to your local grocery store and it's just not, you know, you've got thousands and thousands of beers and sure you've got your, your Budweiser and your Coors, but that, that is nothing compared right. Their market share is basically relatively speaking, it's almost zero compared to the market share of like a club Columbia or Club right. Columbia is what they call it in Medellin. Yeah. And I mean, you it, it's to the point where you could walk down the street during a soccer game and everyone's on the street drinking beer during a soccer game. And 95% of the people would be drinking Club Columbia. Uh, right. Or in Ecuador, I forgot what the, the, the one is. It's, um, I forgot, it's yellow. I, I forgot what the yeah. name of it is. But, th but people need to really realize that who are potentially looking at these countries as investments and looking at what you do and the moat around the businesses oh, it's the phenomenal. Mess because there's exactly. no yeah. way that anyone could yeah. compete with Club yeah. Columbia or the Tanzanian beer, I would guess. That's right. And uh, you know, to stick on Kenya, the, the brewery there is called East African Breweries Limited, EABL. And I don't think I saw any beer other than their brands. When I was in Kenya, yeah, so, you know, almost 100. percent They have different brands, but it's all owned by the same company. It's it's a subsidiary of Diageo uh, out of um, the UK nowadays. So that's the other interesting thing uh, that the the global um, conglomerates or multinationals have bought up a lot of these brands, and you know they now run these companies along Western corporate governance lines, and the, the standards are really quite high, and they're able to attract really good talent. So they, not only is the moat there, but they've kind of protected it even further because yeah. the guys that were perhaps going to come in and compete decided, no, 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 it's all too difficult. We'll just buy the local existing brand and that's how we'll enter the market. Same in cement. Um, Heidelberg Cement is the parent company of, of Twiga Cement, the company that we own here in Tanzania. So, and then again, you know, they completely dominate um, the, the local market around Dar es Salaam. Cement's a bit different because it costs a lot of money to transport around. So you have a geographical mode around your business as well. But yeah, the, the Tanzanian brewer has the biggest one, TBL that we own has 80% market share. It used to be closer to 90, mm. um, but still pretty hefty. I used to live in the Philippines as well. And, um, you know, San Miguel beer there, um, I used to say it's basically a monopoly. You know, they have 95% of the market. So very yeah. similar to Club Columbia, I guess. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, stocks like that should be trading at a premium valuation, but they are actually selling at big discounts to global numbers on, on you know, my readings. Bintang yeah. in Indonesia to talk about another market where I you know, have some, some history. 
Bintang uh, in Indonesia is actually looking like a good buy at the moment because um, Indonesia is a Muslim country predominantly. So a lot of their sales are to, to tourists and tourists haven't been there for a year. So sales were down all last year. Right. But when the tourists come back, well, you know, it's going to recover pretty quickly, I would have thought. Um, so that's one I've actually been looking at uh, for my uh, Global Value Hunter blog recently. That, that's a that's a great idea. Yeah, I remember the beer in Ecuador. It's called Pilsner. That, that's ah. I remember now. <laughs> I should have known because it's on their soccer team's jersey and everything. But um, what are your thoughts right now on Turkey? Uh, have you looked into that market? Turkey uh, was interesting to me for a couple of reasons. A, it's an easy flight from here to go and check it out, and I, I'd love to go and then do so. Uh, they have daily flights from Dar es Salaam to Istanbul. Turkish Airways is one of the airlines that serves the most cities in the world, I think, um, from, from that hub. And cheap real estate, from what I understand, uh, the fact that you can actually get a passport from Turkey if you invest, uh, right. I think it's $250,000 in real estate, that also uh, kind of attracted me to go and check it out. And the other thing um, I noticed uh, about Turkey is it's quite a big manufacturing economy. You know, they have a real economy that's quite diversified and, and manufactures a lot of goods. So here in Africa, when you go and buy, you know, cookware or stuff for your apartment or house, a lot of it is actually imported from Turkey rather than mm. from China. Wow. Uh, so definitely a country that's on my radar. Um, and I, I think for anyone watching that uh, has thought about going and checking it out. Yeah, definitely. If you get the chance, uh, I, I would go and do so. I'm planning on doing that myself. Yeah. And their currency has just gotten crushed. Exactly. In the past probably a year and a half, maybe two years. I mean, it's just falling off a cliff. So boy, if you had dollars going in there with that real yeah. estate, that, that could be interesting. I think so too. And you know, it's um, interestingly uh, running a frontier markets fund. I, I get on these analyst calls and conferences and whatever. There's a lot of uh, Turkish based funds investing in this part of the world as well. You know, it's, mm. it's an economy that's, um, got a lot of talent and, and a lot of capital and outward looking. Um, it, it seems to have a very promising future. What are your views on commodities in general right now? So uh, specifically uh, oil, uh, nat gas, uh, you know, we saw lumber just skyrocket and then come crashing yeah. down. Nat gas has got, gone through the roof. You have all these supply shortages. Maybe it's because of this ESG movement where they're not taking any capital. And so there's not gonna be too much supply coming online in, in years to come. Uh, you know, you got copper. Uh, we've seen what's happened with uranium, with Sprott uh, getting involved there. <laughs> so what, what are your thoughts on commodities right now? Um, in general, I have been bullish and it's also a, a very good thing for African markets generally, given that they tend to be commodities exporters. So whenever commodities are doing well, liquidity tends to flow into these economies, people do better and that, finds its way into people buying products of the, the companies that you know we own. Stock markets tend to go up, uh, but it's a long cycle. Uh, so we're probably still early in, in that. Um, the one uh, thing I was commenting to a friend the other day, I mean, I, I see the supply constraints um, definitely because there hasn't been sufficient investment in productive capacity in a right. lot of these companies. And you mentioned energy and ESG definitely has uh, quite a lot to do with that. Um, so the, it's a structural supply shortage issue in a lot of these things. Uh, and I guess with lumber, that was also what drove it up, uh, very quickly. Uh, we're seeing that in natural gas now and oil to a lesser extent, uh, uranium is kind of a different kettle of fish, but, um, what I worry a little bit about is demand. You know, if, if China really is in trouble with all the, uh, Evergrande and, associated real estate companies kind of on shaky ground and you know the the long talked about china property bubble finally bursting maybe they're going to buy less stuff to use to build with so that's kind of a nagging doubt that i have on the demand side um but you know you got india slotting right in behind china um 1.3 billion people developing quickly needing to build lots of infrastructure 
here in Africa itself, a lot of infrastructure getting built. Um, the U.S. is now talking about spending, you know, another, hey, what's another three trillion bucks or whatever it is on, <laughs> on updating the infrastructure, right? So I, I think, you know, when you when you look at the overall, overall global picture, demand is probably still okay. And with supply kind of struggling to catch up in general with commodities, I think we're in for a pretty good time as commodities investors uh, over the in the near future. What are your views on gold right now? Uh, I'm upset that it's not going up. Why? What, what's <laughs> going on? Like, what, what, what do you think the, I, uh, the reason for I that? Mean, um, I guess uh, there is an element of truth to the fact that a lot of people that might have bought gold as a hedge are kind of enamored of crypto and then mm. there's been a lot of funds that flow into that rather than into gold on a short-term basis. Right. Uh, but, you know, diehard gold bucks, they're never going to give up on it. And uh, if we get some some turbulence in the markets, it seems like a, a great hedge. Uh, certainly not expensive. Everything else is, uh, you know, at, at all-time highs. Gold's one of the only things that isn't. Uh, when, when you talk about developed markets, silver, you know, looks even cheaper relative to, to other stuff. Um, I also have a position uh, in, in a platinum and palladium mining business in Zimbabwe. It's, it's mm -hmm. not actually an African fund. It's, it's in the uh, little Australian investment fund that I run. Um, but that's done well, also precious metals. So I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm very comfortable with precious metals longer term. Um, I, I don't see that, you know, that there's a, a problem. And it's good, as you say, the, the 10, 10, 80 uh, balance, as you said, I mean, Having 10% of your portfolio in, in precious metals or something else tangible uh, makes a lot of sense to me. I, I did the same. Uh, yeah. I, I read a, a analyst, I believe it was yesterday. I don't recall where I read it, but their hypothesis was the ESG folks will go after the gold miners next because that oh, you know, so, creates so much climate change. Or whatever. Or whatever it is they do. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I guess gold mining is a fairly energy intensive business. So, you know, if, we, if we're talking about supply, gold's a difficult one because, um, you know, all the gold that's ever been mined is technically still on the market at whatever price. Um, but it's an energy intensive business. So if oil prices are up, then the cost of mining gold is, is going to be a lot higher. And presumably that eventually feeds through into the price of gold uh, from a supply uh, yeah, and no more capital going. You know, I, I remember who that was. I want to give them credit. That was Russell Napier on the Macro okay. Voices episode last night because Eric okay. asked him about gold and he said, you know, the ESG people could come after it, which would, in his opinion, would make the gold price just skyrocket. Okay, that'd be interesting. Yeah, yeah Russell's always entertaining to listen to. Right? Yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, Tim, do you get into bonds at all or do you just stick with equities? Um, so I had a personal investment in a corporate bond here that uh, was trading at about a 10% discount to par and was yielding or the coupon was 10%. So that was a nice one. But uh, unfortunately, um, most of the government bond markets in Africa are still shut to outside money. So they, mm -hmm. they opened up capital accounts and liberalized capital accounts for equity investors. But certainly here in Tanzania, as a non resident or non-Tanzanian, you can't actually get into the government bond market. So hmm. it's something I'm watching. Um, you can buy into a fund, like there's a local funds management business that has a bond fund. And I believe as a foreign investor, if you register an account with them, you can do it that way. Right. And the yield is very attractive. Uh, you know, the in the paper today, there was another advertisement from the, uh, the government, they're auctioning another 25 year bond um, offering 15.95% coupon. Um, so that gives you an idea of, of what long rates are at. Um, 25 years is a long time uh, in, in a market like this, though. You know, how, what, what's it going to look like in 25 years' time? Nobody knows. Uh, what's inflation going to do? Uh, I don't know. But I think in general, you will have a period where interest rates must come down and bond prices would obviously thus rally. Um, simply because there's so much capital floating around the world and returns are minuscule in a lot of developed markets. So if they were to open it up here, I think money would flow in. I mean, obviously, yeah, I don't, it doesn't. Why on earth would they so not? Right. Yeah. So what they tell me, uh, I've met with the, the policymakers a few times. Um, they're, they're nervous about too much hot money coming in and out. 
So if you look at places like uh, Turkey, which we talked about earlier, Brazil, South Africa, when they liberalized their uh, bond markets, they became um, magnets for a lot of this money that's floating around the world to go in and, and pocket these high interest rates or high yields. Um, but at the first sign of any political trouble or you know another country raising its rates and, and the spreads being better over there, a lot of money also rushes out. So it creates exchange rate volatility. You know, right. you can't have everything stable. Uh, and they're nervous about letting the exchange rate bounce around too much. That's what they tell me. But at the end of the day, the government does have a, a stated policy that they want to get interest rates down. And I've said to them, um, you know, it's a, it's a no brainer, you know, just test it. You know, yeah, right. if, if you don't want to open it up completely, find a way of allowing, you know, some foreign participation, see, see how much money comes in. And I think it'd be a win-win for everybody. The foreign investors would get a better return on their money and rates would come down. Businesses here would obviously benefit from that. And the government would also not have to pay so much uh, interest on, on its borrowings uh, to build this infrastructure that they're, they're building out. So I think uh, in time that'll happen. Um, but I don't see any immediate sign of it. Uh, right. Yeah. So. As, as a global investor, what are your thoughts on not only Bitcoin, but what's happening in El Salvador? Do you, do you, do you think that's oh, a huge I, bullish sign or do you juxtapose that with what's happening in China and saying ah, it's kind of, on net balance, it's kind of a wash? Or, yeah, I, I've, I've kind of always been in two minds, unfortunately, on Bitcoin. For, yeah, unfortunately for me, because that meant I didn't dive in. <laughs> I was first exposed to it in uh, what was 2011. Sovereign Man ran a conference in, in Santiago in Chile. And there were a lot of people there that were, um, you know, talking about it. And I think it was at about $600 back then. <laughs> Don't quote me on that, but it, that, that rings a bell. And the market had been through one of these collapses, you know, from 800 to 600 and everyone was panicking. <laughs> it was like, yeah, <laughs> a lot of water under the bridge since then. But yeah, uh, yeah I have a lot of friends who are, who are deeply into it and they've done very well. And I think the El Salvador uh, move is, is very exciting uh, for the space. Um, but then again, as you say, China, hmm, they're cracking down on it. Uh, governments seem to be confiscating more and more Bitcoin, which I guess is great for the remaining Bitcoin that's circulating. <laughs> you know, the, the price should go up because it's more scarce. Um, so there's risk there, I guess, that yeah, right. you know, it can be shut down or confiscated or whatever. I, I know that the argument is, well, they can never shut it down because it's decentralized and there's enough people that are, um, you know, very heavily into it and, so I hope that's the case. I mean, it's, it's great for freedom. Um, I would love nothing more than to see banks kind of dis, dis what's the word, disintermediated yeah, over decentralized, time. Decentralized, yeah. Yeah, but it, I mean, I guess the, the disappointing thing for me is that it, it hasn't become widely adopted as uh, you know a, a means of exchange or um, some of the other functions that that money is supposed to serve. I mean, it's a great object of speculation and a, a store of wealth for certain people. Um, but we kind of need a, a breakthrough to make it more of a transactional currency. Right. Uh, Bitcoin maybe is not the right one. Uh, maybe one of the others will, will pick up that role. But um, no, uh, I, I hope that Bitcoin continues to do well. Um, and good luck to all those that have done well in it. Um, you know, very very exciting. All right, Tim, we'll go ahead and leave it there. My friend, that was a great conversation for my Thank viewers you. and listeners who want to find out more about what you do, the fund, uh, your, your new blog, where can they go check that out? Uh, so both of them have their own, uh, individual websites. Uh, it's global value hunter.com or one word and African lions fund.com or one word. So Pretty easy to find. Um, and yeah, I'm based here in Tanzania. If anyone's visiting, uh, look me up. Always uh, happy to show people around and share uh, local knowledge. How's the island? Zanzibar nice uh, yeah. is also very nice. Uh, and there's a new uh, investment uh, by, sorry, residency by investment program there that I'm going to go over and check out the details of. I think 
it's $250,000, much like Turkey. Uh, you buy a property there and you can get tax-free residence. So you can actually buy on the island. It's not the name. That's right. So Zanzibar has its own uh, rules and regulations, slightly different ah. from mainland uh, Tanzania. And uh, I don't want to talk too much about it because I need to go over there and really uh, quiz them and, and get the facts straight. But that's, that's a project that I have uh, in mind here before the end of the year. So happy Fantastic. To Will you be writing about that on your blog? I'm sure I will. Yeah. If not, if not Global Value Hunter, then at Sovereign Man, we cover that kind of stuff. So I'll, it'll probably appear there as well. Okay. And then what's the minimum investment for your fund? Uh, for the fund, it's uh, 25,000 US dollars at the moment. Um, Is it open so to non-accredited investors? Aha. Uh -huh, yeah. So the, the one glitch I'm sorry to say is that at the moment we have our full allocation of US uh, investors. And I know probably a lot of your audience is, is global, but many people also in the US. So we're working on uh, getting that cap lifted. We've got to register okay. as investment advisors with the SEC, that's underway. Uh, but for anyone else, anywhere else in the world, it's, uh, it's open and it's $25,000 minimum. You do not have to be an accredited investor uh, to invest in this fund. Uh, okay, the mm -hmm. all right, got it. Tim, I appreciate your time uh, and I just can't wait to have another conversation down the road. Sounds great, George, and uh, it'd be great to see you here in uh, Tanzania or Zanzibar. Hi, guys. I'd like to invite each and every one of you to the next Rebel Capitalist Live event. If you are a fan of the Rebel Capitalist show, I guarantee you, you will love the live event. The next one is Houston, where you can meet and listen to speakers, all your favorites from the Rebel Capitalist Show. People such as Dr. Ron Paul, Chris Cole, Lynn Alden, just to name a few. If you want to check out the rest of the speaker list and find out how you can attend, we'll put a link in the description below, or you can just go to rebelcapitalistlive.com. This is an event where you can learn to build wealth and thrive in a world of out-of-control central banks and big governments. But it's not just about building wealth. It's about increasing your freedom and networking with like-minded individuals, fellow rebel capitalists. It's an amazing event. I know you'll absolutely love it. Check out rebelcapitalistlive.com, and I will see you in Houston.